Hello everybody and welcome back to LMM and if you're enjoying what you're seeing on the channel at the moment how about giving this video a like and maybe subscribe to the channel to help us grow and perhaps even check out our Patreon. Today I'm back at the Middleton Railway to have a look at this during its launch day. This is Sir Berkeley and this is a beautiful Manning Wardle that was built in 1890 believe it or not. It is a proper old machine. It was rebuilt in 1909 to this format by the original builders so it's a local engine that was built literally just around the corner, which is quite spectacular. And this is its first official day back in traffic following a seven year overhaul, I think. It was taken out of traffic in 2016. So if my maths works, that's probably it. And it's first thing in the morning, you can see it's starting to get light in the sky and this has been lit up ready for its day's work. So the Middleton Railways allowed me to come in, have a look at it before it goes out and what an absolutely beautiful thing it is. The most notable thing on it is the fact that there is indeed no cab. You just have a spectacle plate, which is that bit there. Not a cab, spectacle plate. Absolutely superb and massive safety valve cover up there, which is also very nice. Aesthetically, this thing is lovely and it is a L-Class, which is the same as a Matthew Murray that I reviewed uh, last year, I think, on the channel. So the link to that video is coming up on the screen now, so you can check that out and see what one that's kind of very similar but a bit younger is like. But being next door to this, I think the last time I saw this I think was at Railfest or maybe one of the days here at Middleton when it was painted black. Anyway, it looks lovely like this. Absolutely stunning little machine. Now this engine represents part of a deal that's been done between the Vintage Carriage Trust and the Middleton Railway. They financed the work for its overhaul and the guys here at the Middleton Railway carried out that work and actually physically overhauled it. And then as part of that, it lives here and it's based here at the Middleton Railway as part of that deal. And it's kind of, it's a nice working relationship, you know. One of the working engines that fits the theme of the Vintage Carriage Trust. So there's a link to their website in the video description as well so you can see the kind of work that they do. Because it's, it's strange, isn't it, that the Vintage Carriage Trust owns locomotives. Seems kind of counterintuitive to what the actual name is. But I like this, I really like this. And again, having this so close to where it was built is absolutely superb. There's lots of things I really like on this, particularly the wheels, that the counterweight is basically where you could connect the coupling rod if you were that way inclined. Looking onto the cab, the most apparent thing is the springs that come right back onto the footplate, which is actually, when you look think about it, a fairly poor design. Anyway, let's have a look at the footplate. So welcome to the, well, it's not a cab, so we're going to call it the nerve center of Sir Berkeley. And I love this. Look at all the brass and how exposed you are up here. Absolutely superb, isn't it? I mean, this offers no protection from the weather at all. Maybe a tiny, tiny bit from the steam, but not much at all. I love this as well, that the safety valves control to that piece, what you set them on, comes right back into the cab here. So super quick wire up here. That's the pressure gauge. That's the steam feed for this side injector and that's the steam feed for the blower. The water feed for the injector is there and you can see the injector tucked on the side down there. Our gauge frames are here and here. The regulator is here, handbrake there. The reverser is this with the whistle being that one. This one runs the steam for the vacuum with the vacuum brake being there and the vacuum gauge being there. This is the steam brake. This operates the this side injector with the water feed being there. And then down there is the damper. And then the red lever just down there, that's the cylinder drains. It's beautiful up here. I love all the brass. It just feels so wonderfully Victorian. I want to do this. I really want to do this. What an outstanding thing. And what a fantastic view you get along here. Anyway, I can't stay on this for too long. The nice guys have allowed me to come up and have a quick look before it's going to be pulled out of the shed ready for the rededication ceremony, which has got Anthony Calls from the National Rail Museum. He's the curator with a camera doing a bit of a speech. So I'm going to get down, disappear, and um, go see all of that happen. And whilst the crew set about cleaning the engine ready for its grand unveiling, I went back to the car and got <laughs> some more sleep because it'd been a long old drive up from Suffolk. And after my alarm went off, I headed back round to see it draw out of the shed. Oh. 
With the engine now in the light of day, the crew's first duty was to use the technique of bouquets to fill up the engine's bunker with coal. And in the daylight, we could see what an absolutely top-notch job the guys had done polishing the locomotive within an inch of its life. It looked absolutely stunning. And whilst they were busy filling up the bunker, I went and had a look at the other locomotive that was out today, which was Brooks number one. And with the thing in position, it was time for the rededication ceremony to begin. Right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Middleton Railway. I must apologise that um, I'm doing the welcome instead of our chairman. The reason being, it turns out that today is his wedding anniversary and it was more than his life was worth. <laughs> so some new married men will uh, understand that. So. Welcome everybody, in particular we'd like to welcome some of our special guests, obviously Anthony here from the NRM who's going to uh, perform the, the rededication, Trevor England who is our partner organisation, he's my other chairman as I'm vice chair of VCT as well as vice president here, and also last but not least Roger Cromblehorn, give us a wave Roger, who <laughs> Had it not been for Roger in the 1960s actually buying this engine, we wouldn't be stood here today celebrating its entry into service. So, the, the VCT and Middleton have had a very, very good partnership over the years, and Trevor will be talking a little bit about that in a few minutes, and we are very grateful to them for allowing Middleton to operate the engine, over the last few years, it's had a lot of work done to it. We got a lottery grant a few years ago in which it had new tyres and a brand new boiler. And one of the conditions of that boiler was that we <coughs> sectioned the original, which you can see on display in the engine house. We've had various other things done to it as well. And on this overhaul, it's been, you would have thought it was a bit easier, but we found one or two um, entertaining uh, defects. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Trevor here, who like me has got five minutes. Away you go. Right, I'm only going to take two minutes, mainly to do some thank you. First of all, can, Roger, can you just come for a minute? This gentleman here is Roger Trumbull, who 60 years ago preserved this locomotive. If it weren't for Roger, we wouldn't be here today. It's as simple as that. And I'd just like to thank you very much for the work that you did in the 1960s for serving it and it's made a world of difference to the railway preservation movement. Next thing I'd like to thank is the Middleton Railway for the work that it's done in restoring this engine. It's now been a partnership that has lasted well over 20 years and shows the value of partnerships. And uh, I can say that with Ian and uh, Rob Taggart, who is a fireman today, their conflict of interest have been both VCT and uh, Middleton uh, members and operators. Uh, they use their conflict of interest to the best interest of both outfits. Uh, and then I'd like to thank Anthony Cools, who was our former museum mentor. Richard Gibbons here as our museum, uh, our museum advisor in the past and Bob Wynn, who is our present accreditation mentor. Seems to think that every time we change somebody, we have to change the title. <laughs> but again, thanks to Anthony for coming up with this bright idea to actually preserve this engine in this livery. And I hope it's going to be the cleaner and be the motion every time for the next 10 years, because I'm sure this is going to be the cleaner and be so, I can now pass on to the Thank you, Trevor. Baroness Blake, ladies, gentlemen, everybody, rock number one. Good morning. 
it's a pleasure to be with here with you and forgive me if my voice gives out because I'm not sure I've ever had quite such competition. Two steam engines, people 30 feet up there, people 30 feet over there. Normally I say come a bit closer or I will come and see you, but you're stuck behind a barrier so I hope you can hear me. Now, it's a fantastic occasion today and I'm really glad that the weather has held off because we can see this engine in its full glory. Now as a railway and enthusiast, train mad teenager in the 80s, I developed a very unhealthy interest, as my parents might say, in the ironstone industry of the Midlands. I come from Warwickshire, we had the Edge Hill Light Railway just over the border, we had the Oxfordshire Ironstone Railway, and a number of us at school found out about this local history stuff. And yes, teenagers do do history. It's around us now. But by the age of 15, I had all of the nine volumes of Eric Tonks's magisterial work, <laughs> The Ironstone Railways and Tramways of the Midlands. Look it up if you actually want a good read. It's not one for if you're suffering from an inability to sleep. It's really good. And I learned a lot about little steam engines. One of which was the Cranford Quarry system, the Ironstone system, and an engine called Sir Barclay. Now, as time went on as a teenager, I found out that that engine was still in existence, owned by the Vintage Carriage Trust and based on the Worth Valley Railway, but it hadn't run for decades. I followed up its story and finally met more of its illustrious past, including the railway children appearance, which actually I still never seen despite the age of digital <laughs> videos, etc. But finally I met it at the Worth Valley Railway in 1998, painted in what was somewhat approximate to a Kermit green, which was entertaining. I bought a little book, Sir Barclay and Friends, taught me a lot more about the engine, taught me a lot more about the VCT collection and the dynamism that they bring to the heritage movement. And it was running at that day with its first set of driving wheels disconnected, the coupling rods were off, which reminded me of its life as a contractor's engine. And that's it, you know, so often we can remember these engines within living memory as the end of their life with the ironstone or industry, but as a contractor's engine is where, I can't say it made its name because it didn't have a name, but there it was. Very much the equivalent of a dump truck in modern day contractor's world. This is not at a piece of kit as my dear friend Ian Howitt would say down in Wakefield. It's just a thing to do a job, and actually the, old, the paint only stops it going rusty. But what a paint job. The contractors' railways across the UK, from dams, reservoirs, civil engineering contracts, bridge building, canals, and the railway system. There were hundreds of miles of railway doing a job of work away from the Coronation Scot, away, dare I say, from the Flying Scotsman and Mallard. Engines like this were getting on, doing the business, driving British industry. They were pieces of plant, often discarded at the end of their jobs, whether it was a contract that had come to an end, or whether they were supplanted by a more modern piece of equipment. And so therefore, it's such an amazing survival that Sir Barclay, or Logan and Hemingway number 30 as it was, when ordered in 1890, an amazing thing that it would have such a long life as it did, surviving until Roger came and bought it in 1965 for us all to enjoy now. A rare survivor, a special machine, <coughs> and a very useful machine. As I proved a few years ago when we had it at Shildon, at the Locomotion Museum in Shildon, one of our trustees came and said, I've heard this story that people used to cook their breakfasts on the shovel with bacon and egg. I don't believe you. <laughs> so I sent a colleague of mine up to the co-op, I said, right, six buns, half a dozen rashes of bacon, and five minutes later, one of our trustees was learning. <laughs> Engines can teach us not just how they operated, but some of these stories and the ways of life of what they did. So I might work for the National Railway Museum. In fact, I just hot-footed it across there in less than an hour ago, and we are within the hallowed walls of Mallard, Flying Scotsman, Rocket, and the High Speed <laughs> Train. But without such engines, Humble engines, as number 30 was, which built the network and existed in their hundreds. Modern railway wouldn't necessarily have taken shape as quickly as it did. 
the stunning photographs of the SWA Newton collection, showing the building of the last main line, the Manchester, sorry, the London extension of the GC. Show what a great endeavour civil engineering was and building of the railways, and the part played by the contractors therein. And so the story of Savarpi comes full circle, represented for years by the VCT and custodians here at Middleton in her Cranford guise, apart from the uh, rather aesthetically pleasing tin cab, the overall cab, I suspect you guys might wish it to come back at some point if it rains today. When I was the museum mentor, as these chaps have already alluded to, I did suggest that the Logan and Hemingway livery came back in its next overhaul to stand as testimony to the men and machines who completed our railway system in the late 19th and early 20th century. I bless the trustees and the people who painted it and the folks who've got to clean it and maintain it. Here is the result. I'm delighted to see it. I hope you will share in my delight. Welcome them back to me, or Logan and Hegemway, number 30. Thank you very much. Right. The train is at ten past. <coughs> what we'll be doing in a second, we'll move the engine out and onto the front. Now, most of you uh, will be in the second two carriages. Our VIP guests will be in the first carriage. So if you'd like to make your way up to the platform, we'll get you sorted out. And uh, the train will be away. And having been coupled to its train, Sir Barclay departed, officially marking its return to traffic here on the Middleton Railway. And to be part of the day and to be on that first train was a real honour. It was so exciting as the little engine stormed off towards the tunnel, heading up the line. Although we had left to great effect and with much gusto, as we began to make our way along the line, the toll of the gradient started to take effect on our little star engine, and we began to go slower and slower and slower, and it became apparent that something wasn't quite right on board. Determined, however, Sir Barclay plodded on, with the crew doing everything in their power to make sure the engine would keep on going. It became apparent though that it was a losing battle and the driver took the decision to come to a halt to build more steam. And having come to a stand for a few moments, the safety valves once again lifted. But try as they might, the driver could not get the little tank engine to start its heavy train on the curve on one of the steepest parts of the line. So this meant it was time to call for a rescue engine and a member of the crew was sent off with the staff to go get a banker. And Brooks charged up the line to come to our aid. With a guard in place to call the engine on to our stricken train, Brooks slowly, under caution, approached. And then it was coupled up to be the banker on the rear of the train. So we would now be top and tailing, and this would give us the extra shove we needed to get moving again. And with Brooks coupled up to the back of the train, we were ready to make another attempt up the incline.
Having arrived to try to keep the timetable, we were to leave almost straight away, and as we were top and tailed, no time was wasted with a run round. As we headed back down the line, I took a glance over the skyline of Leeds and started to think about the city's once illustrious industrial past. Starting off with all that remains of the Kitson factory with just this arch, which was round the back from the ABB plant, which was what Hunslet became part of, which funny enough, also with rail access, literally next door was the Hunslet factory with this building still standing here. And then next door to that is the Manning Ward factory or what's left of it which was across the road from the McLaren site which obviously is gone but this building has superseded it which was next door opposite Hunslet to Hudswell Clark they literally were all on the same road next door to each other it's just bonkers absolutely blows your mind and they were so close to the Middleton Railway as well which is why stuff got tried out on the line speaking of I returned in time to see Sir Berkeley heading off being banked by Brooks on another trip. Possibly the thing that's excited me most throughout this entire day isn't Sir Berkeley being back in steam or my walk around Leeds or anything, but in fact, it's that over there. That is the happiest wagon I've ever seen. Look at his little happy face. He's just happy to be there. It's like, yay, I'm a wagon. As the day progressed, the locomotives took it in turns running solo trips up the line. And then to mark the end of the day, they ran as a double header. And all too soon, it was indeed the end of the day and Sir Barclay made its way slowly back to the shed. And so this brings us to the end of the day here at the Middleton Railway with Sir Berkeley returning to the shed at the end of, well, the first, well, the proper day, the reunion day, the rededication, the whole return to steam. Well, it's been a real honour, so a massive thank you to the Vintage Carriage Trust for inviting me along to this special event here at the Middleton Railway and allowing me to come along and see this thing. It's been a real privilege to actually be on the guest list to this event. I mean, that's cool, right? To be actually asked to be a guest, be a VIP personally. Really enjoyed it. It's been super fun and lovely to see that because that is a cracking engine. So thank you to the Middleton Railway and I hope you've enjoyed watching it. If you have enjoyed this one, how about clicking somewhere on the screen now for some of the other videos we've done here at the Middleton Railway and don't forget to like, subscribe and maybe even check out our Patreon. So with that, 
thanks for watching and uh, I need to go before they lock the doors. Ta-ra!